Good evening, everybody. I'm glad that you're here. Thanks for coming and being with us tonight. Uh, I don't know if you can see it from out there. I hope you can't, but uh, I'm playing a little John the Baptist. If you see my shoes, I had a fight with a golf cart and lost. So uh, that's what the deal is with the shoes. Don't think that I'm trying to set a trend or anything. But uh, anyway, I appreciate you guys coming and being with us tonight. Tonight's agenda is pretty simple. Uh, we're going to pray, and then we're going to sing a song together just to kind of get our hearts and minds ready uh, for worship. And then uh, Dr. Nance is going to come up and, and share the word with us. So uh, let's, let's pray together. Father, we are so grateful for tonight. We thank you, Lord, for Dr. Nance and the ability that you have given him to preach the word. And we thank you, Lord, that he is here. We thank you for the great food that we just experienced, and we thank you for even the privilege that you give us even tonight to gather in your name. Be with us, Lord. Uh, continue to shower your presence among us. Uh, continue to prepare our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on up and lead us, Stan. Let me invite you to take your hymnals. 100, 100, holy, holy, holy. Let's stand together and sing. Well, it's great to see you all this evening, and um, we're just very joyful and honored that you would ask us to be part of this uh, annual conference. Um, it's a joy to be with you. Thank you to Robbie and Mike and the other leadership for asking us to be here, and <clears throat> some of you from years ago when we were here might remember uh, my son Jackson. Um, older brother to Aaron, and my wife, Sally, my wife Sally's next to Aaron there, but we just dropped off Jackson for his freshman year at Covenant College uh, yesterday, and so we drove today straight from Chattanooga. So if I just burst out into tears all of a sudden or anything like that, you'll, you'll understand what might be behind that, but um, 
It is a joy to be with you to see some faces that I know and uh, to meet some new folks as well. So great to, great to be with you. Uh, Lord willing, over the next, um, well, tonight and then tomorrow, we're going to think about our gracious triune God. And you already had spelled out the, the titles of the sermons on the tables, I noticed. Tonight we're going to speak of and consider our triune God in our worship, <clears throat> tomorrow morning during the Sunday school hour, the Trinity and our walk, and then during the worship hour, Lord willing, the Trinity and our witness, and I turned those things into Mike and then was looking on your, your website, make sure we had the address right and all that, and I noticed that pretty much is your mission statement as a church, um, your worship, your walk or community as God's people, and then your witness to the world. And so we're going to think about how the Trinity informs that, how the Trinity is really the substance of all that, and uh, how the Trinity is the one whom we worship, as we just worshiped him, the one who empowers our walk and who is the substance of our witness. So um, this evening, to start things off, I want us to consider... Uh, St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 2 and verse 18, just one verse to start things off this evening, wherein St. Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 18, for through him, that is through Jesus, the enfleshed, crucified, risen, and ascended Jesus, through him we both, Jew and Gentile, in other words, everybody, who believes in Jesus, through him we both have access, now that's going to be a key theme for tonight, access for the purpose of intimate face-to-face -face interaction, access in one spirit to the Father. Let's look to our God in prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the access, this amazing, shocking access that we have as sinners, but adopted into your family, this access we have into your loving presence through your Son and by your Holy Spirit. We pray that you would fill us this night with your Spirit to worship you with thanksgiving for who you are and all you have done for us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. When Mike told me the strategic scheduling of this conference, you know, as school was starting back, but before football season got cranked up, it reminded me of a story. I may have shared this with you when I was here a few years ago, but it reminded me of when I was, we were just out of college, really, and I was teaching Bible and coaching tennis at a Christian school just south of Atlanta in Fairburn, Georgia. Sally's from Fayetteville in Peachtree City area. I was coaching tennis and teaching Bible at Landmark Christian School. And a couple of years in, I had been sort of discipling some of the young men that were in my Bible classes. And half a dozen of them were football players. And they decided they wanted to play tennis. So they came out with the tennis team, and it was great fun. And we had a, some twins who were linemen on the team, big guys, Mike and Will were their names, and uh, first couple of matches, we started drawing the football crowd to the tennis matches, and we were playing a match at the Peachtree City Tennis Center, kind of a you know, nice place, and the football crowd was there. I had put Will in one of the matches with one of our more experienced players, and the football crowd was hooping and hollering. His twin, Mike, was really, you know, way to knock it and things like that, real technical tennis terms. And finally, their dad reached over and said, calm down, Mike, calm down. This is just a game. This isn't life or death. This isn't football, <laughs> you know. So as I was thinking about that, I was thinking, these are Georgians who know the importance of football, but they know that there's something, someone, even greater than football, and it is He, our triune God, that we consider and we celebrate and we rejoice in and we bask in, that's a word I want you to think about, bask in the love 
of God your Father. Rest in the grace of Jesus Christ. Enjoy. We can't forget, as Calvinists, you know, we have the glorify God part, but sometimes we enjoy. You're going to mumble the enjoy part. But enjoy the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to consider our worship this evening. And really what I want us to consider is the Trinitarian dynamic of our worship. You know, earlier we sang that wonderful hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. We worship the triune God. Implied in that, we were worshiping the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. As the Nicene Creed puts it, they are together to be worshiped and glorified. But this evening, what I want to think about is the dynamic of Trinitarian worship. In other words, the how of worship. How is it that we as sinners are able to approach this thrice holy God and commune with Him? How do we have access to Him? And then what empowers, what energizes, or who energizes this worship? Who motivates this worship? How are we to engage in this worship? And there's a wonderful definition of worship. There's lots of great definitions. You know, the word, the word worship comes from an older word, worthship, to give God his worth, to give God his due. But there's a wonderful definition that captures the Trinitarian dynamic of true Christian worship. It's a definition by J.B. Torrance in his book, Worship, Community, and the Triune God of Grace. And Dr. Torrance said that worship is the gift, okay? It's not something that we earn our way into. It's a free gift, a gracious gift. Worship is the gift of participating by the Spirit, by the help of the Spirit, in the incarnate Son's communion with the Father. Okay, I'm going to repeat that. Worship, true Christian worship, is the gift of participating by the Spirit in the incarnate Son's communion with the Father. That is the privilege that we are entering into when we enter into Christian worship in the name of God's Son and with the help of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want us this evening to consider that the Trinitarian dynamic revealed in Scripture, revealed in the Gospel. I mean, the Trinity is fully revealed in the gospel. The Father sent his Son, the enfleshed Son who lived in our stead, who for us in our salvation, as the Nicene Creed puts it, came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, that is, of her substance. The Father sent his Son, and then, 50 days after the resurrection of our Lord, 10 days after the ascension of our Lord, the Father and the Son together sent the Holy Spirit. So the Trinity is ultimately revealed in the gospel, the Father sending His Son and the Son and the Father together sending the Holy Spirit. But this Trinitarian dynamic of worship revealed in the gospel is part of what we might call Scripture's overall Trinitarian motif, what some have called the Trinitarian geography of Scripture, and we can summarize it this way. The Trinitarian nature of the work of creation anticipates the Trinitarian nature of redemption, which informs the Trinitarian nature of worship. First, creation. We may summarize what the Bible teaches about creation by saying that God's work of creation was from the Father, through the Son, by the Spirit. Creation, from the Father, through the Son, by the Holy Spirit. First, from the Father. The Nicene Creed begins with these words. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. The Apostles' Creed, as you know, begins in much the same way. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And of course, the, these formulations are based on God's revelation of himself as the creator God 
through the Scriptures. St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 8, 6 says, Yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things. The New Living Translation puts it this way, but we know that there is only one God, the Father, who created everything, and we live for Him. So creation from the Father, but also creation through the Son. 1 Corinthians 8, 6 goes on to say, and there is but one Lord Jesus Christ through whom all things came and through whom we live. And we could multiply verses in the New Testament on that reality, right? That creation is through the Son. John 1, 3, speaking of the Son. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Colossians 1, 16, speaking of the Son. All things were created through Him and for Him. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom He also created the world. So creation from the Father, through the work of His beloved Son, by the Spirit. At creation, In Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, many believe we have the Father creating through His Word. He spoke by the Word of His power. He spoke through His Word. That Word in John chapter 1 and verse 1 was with God. The Word was God, toward God. We'll speak more of that tomorrow or later on tonight. God spoke through His Word, the eternal Word, by His Spirit at creation. At creation... We have the Spirit, the Ruach, the wind or breath of God doing what? Hovering over the waters. Now, that's important because later at the baptism of Jesus, how does the Spirit manifest Himself? He comes as a dove and He hovers over Jesus. The word hovers here is typically applied to a bird, bird bird-like movement in Genesis. So when the Holy Spirit descends upon Jesus in the form of a dove, Luke says bodily, in the form of a dove, he is indicating that through Jesus there's going to be a recreation, a new creation. Jesus is going to make all things new. Here at creation, he hovered over that which was what? Without form and void. The implication is the Holy Spirit is the one that took that which was spoken into existence, but was without form and void, and he ordered it. He made the cosmos out of that which was without form and void. That's why the early church fathers called the Holy Spirit the beautifier. Or we might very reverently refer to him as the divine, holy cosmetologist. He takes that which is out of order, and he orders it. He beautifies it. He does that at creation. He does that in each of your lives as new creations in Christ. He's reordering your life to reflect the beauty of God, the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We read in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7 that the Lord God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. So it was by the Spirit, the Ruach of God, that man became complete as an image bearer of God. Psalm 33 and verse 6, a beautiful verse in which all three members of the Trinity are at least intimated by the Word, the Son, of the Lord, Yahweh, the Father, were the heavens made their starry host by the breath, or the Spirit, of His mouth. And then Job 26, 13, one of my favorite verses in Scripture, particularly the King James Version. The ESV says, by His Spirit, He beautified the heavens. The King James, anybody know the King James? By His Spirit, He hath garnished the heavens. Isn't that beautiful? Our creation is not this bland, boring thing. God shows off, you know, like you do at Christmas time, when you, you put out all your decorations to celebrate the coming of Christ, the advent of our Lord. God has done that with creation. He's garnished the heavens. He's made everything beautiful by His Spirit. 
So creation was from the Father, through the Son, by the Spirit. And this anticipated redemption. And in redemption, there's a two-way movement. There's a two-way movement. Redemption is from the Father, through the Son, by the Spirit. But it's also to the Father, through the Son, by the Spirit. In the first movement of the economy of grace, redemption from the Father. The Father sent His Son. He sent His Son. He spared not His own Son, but gave Him up for us all. John 3, 17 says, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. That's why He sent His Son. If God just wanted to send us all to hell, which is what we deserve, He certainly wouldn't have sent His Son. If if there were any other way by which we could have been saved, when Jesus prayed to the Father in the garden, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me, don't you think the Father would have said, yes, my dear son, there's another way. You you stand up. I'm going to spare you. But no. I'm not going to spare you as I I allowed Abraham to spare his son. I'm going to give up my son. God sent his son to redeem us from the Father. And this redemption is accomplished through the Son, Ephesians 1, 7. We have redemption through His blood. There was no other way but through the blood of the Lamb. And this redemption is applied, how? By the Spirit. Many verses we could mention there, but what about Romans 5, 5? The love of God has been poured out into your hearts by the Holy Spirit. The the love that the Father and the Son have for one another, that love has been poured out into your heart by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't want you to have a dry heart. Jesus referred to the Holy Spirit as as rivers, not a trickle, rivers of living water. And so the Holy Spirit is the one who pours out the love of God into our hearts. Did any, I see so many children tonight. You ever seen Dude Perfect? Anybody here like Dude Perfect? We have people that aren't children raising their hands. Yeah, who doesn't like Dude Perfect? Well, you know, one of their stereotypes, restaurant stereotypes, one of their stereotypes is of the waiter who keeps bringing the pitcher of water. You take one sip and he just they keep, you know, he, won't, he won't let you get the water down at all. He just keeps filling and the, and the cup's just overflowing all the time, right? The Holy Spirit, we can reverently say, is like that waiter. He is constantly willing and ready. As we yield ourselves to Him, as we open up to Him, as we depend on Him, as we ask Him, Jesus said, if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? If we ask for the Holy Spirit's help in our lives, you know, like when you're like dropping a son off for college, and all the vicissitudes, the difficulties, the challenges, the trials, the tribulations of life, We ask for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit pours out the love of God in our hearts. Redemption from the Father, through the Son, by the Spirit. But the redemption is also to the Father, through the Son, by the Holy Spirit. You know, Hebrews 3.1 speaks of Jesus as being the apostle and high priest of our profession or our confession. In other words, he is our apostle and he is our high priest. Now, what's an apostle? I mean, that's interesting that the writer to the Hebrews would refer to Jesus as an apostle. What's an apostle? Apostle means sent one. The father has sent his son. He's the ultimate apostle. And that's why he told his apostles, as the father sent me, so send I you. So Jesus is our apostle sent from the father. To reveal the Father. Philip said, show us the Father. Jesus said, if you've seen me, Philip, you've seen the Father. You've seen the heart of the Father. You've seen the love of the Father. You've seen the character of the Father reflected in the face of the Son, in the life of the Son, the death of the Son, the service of the Son. So he is the apostle of our faith, but he's also the high priest of our faith. For us in our salvation, he became man. He became robed in our nature, bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh. The dust of the earth now sits at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus 
is the great high priest. And there you have that second movement. Apostle, the first movement. To us, he unites himself to us. He is our high priest. What does a high priest do? He offers sacrifice to God. What was the sacrifice Jesus offered to God? Himself. How did he do it? In our flesh, anointed by the Spirit. The whole of his life on this earth was an offering of himself to the Father by the Spirit. Isaiah 11 foretold it. You know, that wonderful prophecy of how the Spirit was going to anoint the, 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 the seed, the stem, the rod of Jesse to do all that he did. Everything that Jesus did, he did empowered by the Holy Spirit, anointed by the Holy Spirit. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He was anointed by the Spirit, as we already mentioned, at his baptism. He was led by the Spirit, driven. I mean, it's a violent term, actually. It's the same term that Jesus used, uh, that's used of Jesus when he, when he threw out money changers from the temple. That's the power with which the Holy Spirit compelled Jesus. I mean, Jesus wasn't resisting, but the Holy Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted in our stead. Now, why would he do that? I mean, we pray every, you know, I'm sure you, you pray regularly. You know, lead us not into temptation. But Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. Why would he, why would he do it? Well, to defeat Satan, to crush the head of the serpent, to bind the strong man, to destroy the work of the devil in our place as Christ our victor, the conqueror through whom we conquer and endure and to fulfill all righteousness on our behalf to never give in to sin, tempted in every way we are, yet without sin. So the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to do for us what we have not done for ourselves. I mean, our first parents were in paradise, and they sinned against God. Here Jesus, the second Adam, goes into the wilderness with the wild beasts and all of that to be tempted, and he did not give in to sin. That's called worship. That's called offering himself without blemish to God. The whole of his life, we we need to understand, was worship, an offering of himself to God. The early church, Father Athanasius, was very good on this. You know, there was a a not-so-good guy named Arius. You heard of him? And he taught, you know, he went around, he, he, he tried to make his theology proper, uh, popular through hymns. I mean, hymns will popularize uh, theology. Um, some people said that Reformation wouldn't have stuck if it hadn't been Luther, from Luther's hymns, you know. And Arius knew that, and so he, he sang these little ditties like, there was a time when the sun was not, and things like that. And he would make fun of Orthodox Christians, Trinitarian Christians, and say, you know, in the Gospels, it clearly shows Jesus praying. Now, why would God need to pray to God? That doesn't make any sense. The great Athanasius, the the champion for Trinitarianism, responded, Arius, you do not understand grace. Now, what did he mean by that? He meant that God required of us, humanity, perfect worship, perfect consecration to God. We have failed to do it. Our first parents failed to do it. We've all failed to do it. We've all failed to render to God the worship He deserves. So what did God do? He sent His Son to step in to be the perfect worshiper for us, to be the perfect man of prayer for us. That's grace. Athanasius said to Arius, God has provided in Jesus all that he requires of us, including perfect worship. So, the whole of his life, an act of worship. His passion, certainly, an act of worship. Hebrews 9, 14, he offered himself, he offered his blood without blemish to God. That's God the Father. By the eternal spirit, that that his blood might cleanse our consciences from dead works to serve, could be translated to worship the living 
God. So God the Father has provided in Jesus the worshiper that we deserve, that, that, that he deserves, the worship that he required. Our salvation is rendered to the Father through the, through the incarnate Son by his Spirit. Likewise, our worship is of the Father through the incarnate Son and by his Spirit. And this is good news. This is good news. Again, there's only one perfect worshiper. There's only one perfect offering, and it is not our offering. It's the offering of Jesus of himself, the offering he made on the cross, the offering he still makes in the sense that he still intercedes for us and represents us to the Father, represents all who come to God through him. This was intimated in the Old Testament. I mean, you think of, again, you think of the Garden of Eden, a kind of temple. Adam and Eve were to be those perfect worshipers. Adam, a priest of all creation. But they, they failed in that, didn't they? That fellowship for which we were made came to a screeching halt when they turned away from God in sin. But God promised to provide a restore, the seed of the woman, who would crush the head of the serpent and restore humanity to God. We could, we could mention other Old Testament passages, but one other I'll just mention, Exodus 33. Exodus 33, the tent of meeting. Remember how in Exodus 33 we read that Moses had a unique privilege. He had a unique privilege of all the Israelites. It says that Moses would meet with God at the tent of meeting and that God would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. No other Israelite enjoyed that privilege. Who's our tent of meeting? Jesus. The word we mentioned earlier, John 1.1 1, 1, and John 1.14, that word, the eternal word, who was face to face with the Father for eternity, he became flesh and dwelt among us. Again, King James people, what does it say? He tabernacled among us. He pitched his tent, literally, among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is our tent of meeting. He's the one through whom we meet with God the Father face to face. Jesus is our sympathetic high priest through whom we can draw near to the throne of grace with boldness. Do you believe that Christians are supposed to live with boldness or is that cocky? Is that out of place for Christians to be bold, to be confident? No, Scripture says God the Father wants you to be confident. I mean, don't you want your children to be confident in your love for them? How much more the Heavenly Father wants you to be confident and bold in your worship, in your walk, and in your witness for Him? Jesus is our high priest who makes that possible, enables us, bids us to draw near to the Father with boldness. He is our sacrifice. We've already mentioned that from Hebrews 9, 13. Jesus is our preacher in worship. You know, whose voice do you want to hear in worship? Only Jesus' voice speaking to you. His sheep know his voice. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 12, we hear Jesus say, these are words from the Old Testament, but we hear Jesus say them through the writer of Hebrews. They're, they're, They're Placed on Jesus' lips there, Hebrews 2.12, we hear Jesus say, I will tell of your name, whose name? The Father's name, to my brothers. Jesus is not ashamed to call you his brothers and sisters. And when you gather, he tells you how wonderful his Father is. In John chapter 4, he's speaking to the, Jesus is speaking to the woman at the well, and he said, my Father is seeking worshipers, who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, typically, when the word spirit is used in John, it's speaking of the Holy Spirit. And typically, when truth is used, it's speaking with reference to Christ. You know, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So many believe, and the church fathers certainly, believe that Jesus was speaking there, the Father seeking worshipers who will worship him in spirit, that is, by the Holy Spirit, 
and in truth through His Son. In other words, you can, you can characterize Jesus' mission in many ways. Christ came into the world to save sinners. Christ came into the world to destroy the works of the devil. But one of the ways you can understand the gospel and the Bible as a manual of worship and for the purpose of worship is that Jesus came to get worshipers for his Father. That's how much he loves his Father. My, my uncle Eldon, who was a very saintly man, unexpect, unexpectedly, it was a tragic accident, about a year ago, passed away. And went home to be with the Lord only a few weeks before they had written me the sweetest handwritten note encouraging me. And thankfully, I wrote him back. But a few weeks after that, he, he passed away. And this was, you know, there was this beautiful old Moravian church. It was in the, the uh, churchyard of the church. It was during uh, COVID, and, and uh, so the service was outside. And his oldest son, Tommy, my cousin, he just... He gave the eulogy, and he just talked about how wonderful his dad was, and he, he just belted out. He wanted all of Winston-Salem, North Carolina, to hear this. He said, my dad was the greatest. And I thought, you know what? That's what Jesus came to tell you. My father is the greatest. He's the father of fathers. He's the greatest father you could ever have. So you come to him through me, and you have new life, abundant life, real life. Life apart from his, it's a sham. You come into his presence, into his family, his forever family, into his adopting love through me by the Spirit. Because my Father deserves your worship, your adoration, your life. So, Hebrews 2.12, Jesus is the great preacher, saying, I will tell of your name, Father, to my brothers. Jesus is our song leader in worship. Hebrews 2.12 goes on to say, Jesus says there, in the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. He's again speaking to the Father. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. Commenting on Jesus as our song leader, C.H. Spurgeon said this, in the midst of the congregations of heaven and earth, I mean, don't forget when you worship, you're worshiping with the church triumphant. Well, who's leading all this worship? In the midst of the congregation of heaven and earth, Jesus Christ is the sweetest of all singers. When we pray on earth, our prayers are not alone, but our great high priest is there to offer our petitions with his own. When we sing on earth, it is the same. Is not Jesus Christ in the midst of the congregation gathering up all the notes which come from sincere lips to put them into the golden censer? and to make them rise as precious incense before the throne of the infinite majesty. So that he is the great singer rather than we. He is the chief player on all our stringed instruments, the great master of true music. The worship of earth comes up to God through Jesus. And he, he is the accepted channel of all the praise of all the redeemed universe. What an encouragement then to draw near to God and worship Him when we know we have that access. Hebrews 8.2, just to mention one more, says that Jesus is at the right hand of the majesty in heaven as a minister in the holy place. Now, the word in Greek is leturgos. You hear the word laity. Leturgos means one who works on behalf of the people. On behalf of hoi polloi, the average Joes, you know. Jesus works on behalf of the people in our worship. He's leading our worship. You also hear in that word liturgos what? Liturgy. Jesus is the great liturgist of all our worship. The worship of heaven and earth. He is presenting all the worship of heaven and earth to the Father with his nail-pierced hands, perfectly sanctified. What an encouragement to worship our God. So, Jesus alone is our access to that intimate fellowship with the Father in worship. And the Holy Spirit assures us of this worship. The Holy Spirit assures us that we are no longer slaves, 
but we are children. The spirit of adoption, the spirit of God's Son, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. He assures us of the Father's love and that we are accepted in the Beloved. So, friends, God does not want you to live with doubts when it comes to His love for you. God does not want you to live with doubts when it comes to how much He delights in you and delights to have you draw near to Him in worship. God has adopted you as His child. He has accepted you in His beloved Son for a reason. He likes having you around. You know, I've said this to my sons for a long time. I mean, you know, you, when you drop your oldest off at of college, you start wondering, okay, what did I not tell them that I should have told them, right? You think everybody does that. But the Holy Spirit, I believe, assured me of something. I have told him pretty much every day of his life that I love him and that God loves him. From a very early age, I've asked my, both of my boys particularly when they were real little, I would ask them before they went to bed every night, who loves you most? And they would say, God. And, you know, I've, last few years I've told, I started telling my sons, I heard somebody else say this, and so I started telling my sons, I love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. We well, you know God the Father says that to you in Jesus. I love you with a love that's not going to let you go. I love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. I love you the same love with which I love my eternal son, the one about whom I said at his baptism, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Jesus, if you're in Jesus tonight, the Father delights over you like that. And thus he delights to see you come to him in prayer and worship. You know, you, some of you remember this, the younger ones don't, but there was a time when there wasn't caller ID, children. There was actually a time when there wasn't caller ID. You just picked it up, you didn't know who it was. But now there's caller ID, so you can choose not to pick it up if you don't want to pick it up based on who it is. And sometimes we get in our minds, like, when I pray or when I come to sing to God or something like that, He sees my name on the caller ID, and He's not very pleased with me because of stuff I've done. And so He's not going to pick up the phone. Well, guess what? When you as a Christian pray in Jesus' name, guess whose name the Father sees on that caller ID? He sees Jesus, His beloved Son. And He loves you in Him. And so He picks up the phone. He delights to hear your voice on the other other end. He loves you. He delights in your fellowship. You think He would have put His Son... Sent his son to go through all he went through if he didn't delight in your fellowship. That's why Jesus went through it, was to restore you to that fellowship. As the father in the parable of the prodigal son, in Jesus, he throws his arms around you and kisses you, puts a robe on you and a ring on you and throws a party over you with dancing and feasting and loud music. That's the love of the Father for you. He sings over you, and He invites you to draw near and sing to Him and pray to Him and enjoy fellowship with Him. This is the God whom we worship. Not a miser, not a Scrooge, but the self-giving God who loves our fellowship. So let the grace, love, and fellowship of the triune God embolden and infuse your worship with fresh joy and gratitude and let the reality of who He is and His love for you give you victory over anxieties and fears. Don't let the devil whisper in your ear, God doesn't want to hear from you. You listen to the good news of God in Jesus Christ. He delights in you. He loves to have you worship Him. Worship, the gift, the free gift of participating by the Spirit in the incarnate Son's communion with the Heavenly Father. Let's look to the Father in prayer. 
Our gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this amazing good news that you don't cross your arms and stand afar off, unwilling to receive us, but rather in Christ you run out to greet us and to embrace us and to celebrate over us. We give you thanks for the gift of worship, of communion with you, of fellowship with you, of of rendering unto you the glory that you deserve. We pray that all of life would be worship, but that we would have those special times in our homes and as individuals, as families, and that corporate worship, we would see this as a true gift in which we get to commune with you and be assured of your love and be propelled out to witness to others of your great and saving deeds in Christ. So, Lord, even this night we pray for good rest, that we might return tomorrow with these things informing our hearts, that there would be a joy in our hearts as we worship you through your beloved Son and by the ministry of your gracious Spirit. This we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen.